I'm Dr. King, and today I'm representing the Department of Biology and its two associated programs, the Environmental Sciences and Neuroscience programs. The goal today is to share with you why I think research is fundamental to a growing scientist's career and make you aware of the array of possibilities for conducting research that exists within the Department of Biology and its two programs, Environmental Science and Neuroscience. In order to really make it clear why research is important to a person as well as to the world entire, I need to tell you something of a science story. Uh, what's represented here is not unique to my lab or even to this one story, but every single time I see it happen for someone, to see them understand the power of research in their own hands, every time it inspires me to work harder and longer and to continue forth in research work. So what do I mean? So the research story I wanna tell you is represented in this simple experiment. We set out to ask a very simple question using immunohistochemistry followed by immunofluorescent microscopy. Produced this image. What you're seeing here is the protein that we study in the cells within the brain that it is expressed within. The red protein exists in cells that also express the green protein. And our question was, do the two proteins overlap in their expression zone within the cell type? Could they be functioning together because they're close by? That simple question was answered when we merged those two images and anywhere on this screen where you see what appears to be kind of a yellow intermediate color between red and green represents a place where the two proteins are very close together. So we've answered our question. We definitely have zones where they're not together, but there are plenty of places on, in this cell where red and green co-localize. It's a beautiful picture. I love fluorescent microscopy. I love the detail that it can see and that I'm one of only a handful of people that have ever seen this. It's amazing. And we generated a new fact, a fact that will without a doubt make it into a publication soon. In order to be confident that we're interpreting this fact right though, we had to look at our controls. And that is where things went from interesting to phenomenal. All right, so a uh, normal brain, this is what we're expecting to see. And if our interpretation that the red protein is expressed in these cells is correct, our genetically modified mice that don't make the red protein should show no red protein. And that is in fact what happened. So we have a nice control, a clear interpretation of the red protein. What we are not expecting, and yet what happened, was we saw changes in the green protein. So the protein we did not genetically modify or in any way alter ourselves, biologically is affected by the deficiency of the red protein. That is not a statement I make lightly. We did it over and over and over and over again, <laughs> testing different brains to see if this was consistently true. And when we put our images side by side, normal versus deficient in the red protein, there is no doubt about it, there's less green protein. I would love to tell you exactly what that means, but I have absolutely no idea. And that's what's exciting. We asked a simple question, we got a direct answer. And we also got a mystery, a mystery that is driving us to change priorities in the lab, design new experiments, and get incredibly excited about this unexpected, potentially breakthrough discovery. Because what we know to be true is that in order for the brain to function normally, you have to have these cells functioning normally. And the green protein that is represented in normal levels here. It's, it being at lower levels in this tissue means we have a very sick brain and maybe a mechanism to explain illness in people once we do the research to prove it. And that right there is fundamentally what is so exciting about research. Discovery of facts and ideas that we didn't even know were questions that we had in our mind when we started. Before I started as a working scientist, when I was a student of science, not a participant, 
I honestly thought that everything that we know, uh, the facts and the knowledge that fill our textbooks and filled my life with study, uh, that these facts were the stuff that we'd known for forever. It wasn't until my hands started producing data and I saw new facts actively be discovered in my presence and then saw the vast amount of additional work that was required to understand the meaning and interpretation of those facts. It wasn't until then that I realized that science was alive and advancing. And not just in making pills for everyone, even as important that is, as that is, but advancing as in our fundamental understanding of how biology works. Constantly advancing. <laughs> the stuff we've known forever are really the facts that we've discovered and interpreted recently, at least to the level of detail that we know for now. But every single day, fact by fact, we're pushing back the boundaries of what we don't know creating new knowledge because people in labs, labs of all kinds, <laughs> are doing experiments and returning results, both expected and unexpected groundbreaking new data, fact by fact by fact. Our department is no different. The faculty laboratories in biology, environmental sciences, and neuroscience are all conducting discovery level research here at Creighton, powered by collaboration between undergraduates and faculty. Those discoveries are translating into publications so that our secret facts, what only we know in our lab, become facts known across our discipline. And those discoveries are inspiring our students to recognize the power that they personally have, not just to learn what's known, that's important, but to also actively participate in the discovery of what is not known, at least what's not known today. And so that leads to the question we have for you today. <laughs> Are you going to contribute to this discovery of new knowledge? Are you willing to join one of our teams to learn something new, to do something that is legitimately hard? in order to contribute to pushing back the boundaries of what we know because you've discovered what we didn't know. If you are interested in becoming a partner in this incredible endeavor, we have opportunities around our department and its associated programs for you to find a place to contribute. And so I'd like to take you on a short tour of the Department of Biology. The biology department main office is on the fourth floor of the Riggy Science Building. You come off the elevators on the fourth floor and our departmental office is right here. We can direct you to whoever you would like to talk to. Most of the research labs are housed in the Riggy Science Building, probably a place you spend a fair amount of time already. But we're on the third, fourth, and fifth floors of the Riggy Science Building. On the third floor of Riggy, you'll find the Cho, Brockhaus, and Shibata labs. Dr. Cho is interested in understanding molecular evolutionary genetics and genomics as it relates to insect sex determination and sociality. Dr. Brockhaus is another geneticist. He conducts research to understand the genetic diversity of marine and aquatic organisms. And in particular, he's interested in understanding the black fly which is a blood sucking insect that threatens the health of literally millions of people worldwide every year. Dr. Shibata is working to determine how the immune system and the nervous system interact, both during development and after the nervous system has been injured and is trying to repair. If we move to the fourth floor of Riggy, there you'll find the Worthington, Frankie, King, Cullum, and Reedy Labs. Dr. Frankie is working to determine the cellular and genetic characteristics that make the Planktomyces bacterium Gemata obscuroglobuloso particularly an amazing bacteria. 
Dr. Worthington's studies in vertebrates, using them as a model organism to investigate environmental and, and physiological cues that are required to maximize reproductive efficiency. Dr. King is me, and you've sort of figured out I'm into the brain. I'm very much into understanding what's different about the aging brain and how we could better support it. Dr. Reedy is interested in the molecular basis of how tissues change shape and form during development of both the nervous system and the heart. Dr. Cullum is an evolutionary and comparative physiologist who works to better understand whole organism performance traits. When it comes to Riggy 5, the fifth floor of Riggy, that is a hotbed of research within the Department of Biology because on the fifth floor of Riggy, you will find the Shea, Vinton, Taylor, Shallis, Riviera, Burke, Kavanaugh, and Fassbender Orth Labs. Definitely a hotbed of research activity. Dr. Shea is a parasitologist. He works to understand parasite altered behaviors of the host, as well as to understand what parasites can tell us about the health of entire ecosystems. Dr. Vinton's research is focused on the connection between people, the land and sustainability. And she studies this using one of the world's largest continuous grasslands, Nebraska's own sand hills. Dr. Taylor's research centers around better understanding reproductive development of flowering plants. And in particular, she is into the discovery of everything about pollen. Dr. Shallis is 100% about wetlands and wetland science. You will literally find him knee deep in wetlands all summer long as he works to, to better understand wetland ecology. Dr. Riviera is focused on the big picture, uh, big picture as in morphology. And the factors uh, we can observe in morphology that drive phenotypic evolution and phenotypic variation. Dr. Burke is the man to call if you need a net in particular a butterfly net. As a conservation biologist, he's very much uh, interested in better understanding social behavior of insects with a special focus on the prairie butterfly. Dr. Kavanaugh uses yeast in her research. Her research focuses on the spindle pole body, which is a critical organizing and regulating center in the formation of the yeast's mitotic spindle. Dr. Fassbender Orth has a video on her website that you absolutely want to see. And her work is to better understand ecological immunity and disease ecology. Most famously, her studies focus on honeybee health and viral dynamics. Now, I can't tell you what you're gonna be doing in each of these labs or even guarantee you a specific kind of experiment because these are active research labs. And so every day the priority and the facts that they have discovered are changing. While I can't tell you exactly what you'll research in any of these labs, what I can tell you is the most important decision you can make when starting into a research lab is to find a research subject that captures your imagination and your curiosity. With that as a first step, it will launch you into a research experience that I'm confident will allow you to contribute to the discovery of new knowledge. Think about it. Where would you like to invest your time, your talent, and your energy? Our department is hard at work, <laughs> but we constantly need new innovation new hands, new hearts, and new minds to ensure that we can continue discovering new knowledge, fact by fact by fact. <laughs>